Hello, and thank you for joining us online today. My name is Dante, and I'm the executive pastor here at Father's House. Thank you so much for being with us. We will be continuing our Aftermath series, part seven, with our lead pastor, John Quince. Welcome to our online community. We're so glad that you joined us again. Hey, today we're going to be talking about part seven in our series, Aftermath, where we're looking at the ascension of Jesus. Through this series, we've been looking at experiences Jesus had post-resurrection. For 40 days, he was on earth uh, after the resurrection and encountering people and having experiences with people. And we've taken a dive through this series. But today, we're going to start in Acts 1, and we're going to look at a conversation and experience that Jesus had with his disciples and others right before he's ascended to heaven. So in Acts 1, verse 1, it says, In this first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them, during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. As we look at this experience that Luke records here in Acts 1, when I was reading this, I just kept coming back to this statement. It says in verse 2, until the day that he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. You know, when we look back to the Gospels, we actually get to see these encounters where Jesus finds these disciples that he almost hand selects. They didn't come to him and fill out an application. Rather, he went to them and chose them. And Peter, you know, you're a fisher, but follow me because I want to make you a fisher of men. When I was thinking about being chosen, my mind immediately went back to an experience that I had in high school. I had just finished my freshman year of basketball and it was after the season and there was a bunch of guys getting together at a local gym to play some pickup games. And we had some older dudes and we had some younger dudes and I just happened to be right in the middle. And so what they were doing is they were picking teams and so they chose the older guys, they became the captains and they were selecting who they wanted to be on their team. And I was really surprised how I was, one of the, I was like the third or fourth guy chosen above other seniors, younger people. And I remember the confidence that came. I'm thinking, man, they chose me? I mean, these guys are scoring double digit figures in in a game and they're choosing me to be on their team. Here we are, we tip off, we're playing, we go down the court a couple times and next thing I know, one of the main guys is throwing me the ball. I'm on the outside, I'm wide open and I've taken this shot numerous times in games and practices in my backyard. I take the shot and I completely miss. I mean, it bounces off the rim bad and the other team gets it. And I remember one of the older guys, he kind of gives me a look out of the corner of his eye like, bro, you better step this up. We chose you because we wanted to win. A couple times down later, I'm wide open on the three-point line. They throw me the ball and I shoot and I miss it again bad. This time my nerves are getting the best of me as two or three guys are looking at me. One of them yells, Coats, get it together. They knew I could make the shot. They played with me in a game. They knew I had what it took. And so a couple times more down, here's my third chance. I am so nervous because I know if I miss this, I'm going to let the team down. 
I'm going to let myself down because I know that I can make the shot. And as I'm thinking about that, and I know that if I miss it, I'm not going to get the ball again. I take the shot and I miss it all. I mean, it's just air ball. Don't even hit the rim. It's completely short. And I remember the rest of the game, I never got the ball back. I'd be wide open. I'd even have one time where I had a wide open layup, never got the ball. They did it. Trust me. And so many times when we approach the scriptures, sometimes what it's easy to do is try to relate Jesus to how we would deal with things. But here Luke lets us know and reminds us of who Jesus is having a conversation with right before he's ascended to heaven. It's these apostles whom he had chosen. Now we know that he chose them before he ever died on the cross, but Luke lets us see here that in verse three, it says he presented himself alive to them these same disciples whom he had chosen after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. I love this passage of scripture because here's what Jesus would have done if he was me. Jesus would have been raised from the dead and he would have looked at these guys and women and said, listen, You missed it. You remember when he's raised from the dead and the women, they see that the grave is empty. They go back to the men and they're like, hey, Jesus isn't there. Peter and John are the only ones that run back to the tomb to check to see if Jesus is there. We have several encounters that we've looked at through this series where where people, even though they have a resurrected Jesus, they still missed the mark. They still had shortcomings. But here Jesus is getting ready to leave earth. He's getting ready to be ascended to heaven and the entire trust that he's giving these disciples is not what I would have given them. There's no way I would have given them and let them have the authority of the kingdom of God. They, they've had shortcomings. They've missed the mark. I probably would have treated them like I was treated on the court. Hey, you got one chance. You had a second chance, but three times, bro, you're out. And that's how we deal with people, isn't it? When we trust them with our life, we trust them with our heart. Maybe there's someone that that we've trusted over and over again and they continue to prove themselves unfaithful. We even classify them. We change their status rather than, hey, that's my, hey, they just can't be trusted. We add that and tag that onto their name. But here, that's not what Jesus does. No, why? Because Jesus is showing us the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of this earth. See, here's what's cool, what Jesus shows us in this experience and shows us through all these experiences that your shortcomings do not change your status with Jesus. Jesus fully accepts you as you are. And your shortcomings don't change that. Paul said it a little bit differently and gives us this idea to show us how the kingdom of God operates in Ephesians 2. One, it says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, this world, the spirit that is now in the work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. By nature, our natural state our humanity, it is it's short, it, it's short all the time. It doesn't come up to God's standards. It continually falls short. And when we don't understand the kingdom of God, what we'll do is we'll judge ourselves and we'll judge God's kingdom based on my standards. So when, when I fail someone, when I fail myself, when I don't treat people the way that I know I should have treated them, when I know I have the ability to do what it takes and I still fall short. I don't know about you. It's one thing when others reject me. It's another thing when I'm laying in bed, looking at my life, realizing I had what it took and I still didn't do it. I tend to reject myself. And these feelings, what they do is they stop right here. They stop me in verse three. I deserve wrath. I don't deserve Jesus. I don't deserve God's promise. I don't deserve a relationship. And so I try to act holy. I try to think holy. I try to and change things about me. But I love what Ephesians reminds us in verse four about God and God's kingdom. Verse four in Ephesians two says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even 
When we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, this is what God did. While we deserved wrath, while our shortcomings deserved rejection, while our shortcomings deserve not to have the ball passed to us, no, the kingdom of God is different. Your status doesn't change with God because of your shortcomings. Your status is determined by your faith in Jesus. We have to have this understanding if we're going to work with God. Because I love what Luke goes on to describe in Acts 1.4. While staying with them, Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. I love this statement. Remember, they just had, Peter had denied Christ three times. You know, he still had issues going back to fishing and still wondering if he measured up. And we have all these things and none of these things stopped Jesus from sending and making the promise of God able to be given to them. It says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. You know, the other day I was working on a computer and I was trying to help somebody and they needed something really quick. They were in a hurry and I was trying to help them out. I was trying to get them some information and they were trying to order something, and, and the special, uh, you know, had like like five minutes left. They had to order it to get the special, and so I'm, I'm I'm on this computer, but it's a computer that I haven't really dealt with in a long time. It's a PC. I've had a Mac for years, and so my mind is just set to work with the Mac. So I'm sitting there. I can't even open the internet. I'm trying to find where to even get on the internet. I'm trying to find where to to, to do it. And I just remember, I even said, I'm so confused. I feel like I'm lost. Man, I went home later that night. I pulled out my laptop and to do some other work. And I remember it just, it was effortlessly. It just effortlessly worked. I knew everything and how it worked. And that's how I kind of look at what happens when we try to deal with God on human standards. We're using a, a, the wrong operating system, one that, that it just doesn't work. It's, it takes so much energy and we still, at the end of the day, it doesn't work. Have you ever tried to please everybody? You will find, no, even on your best day, there will be somebody that you didn't measure up to their standards. You go to work and you find it seems like it's the perfect job maybe, but there's gonna be something about it. There's gonna be someone there that you just don't gel with. Your personalities are in conflict with one another. Shoot, you don't have to go to work. You, you experience that at home. There's someone in the house right now that your personality and their personality, it's just a natural conflict. Not careful, that natural conflict, it, it can lead to feeling rejected. Man, at the end of the night, I don't know about you, but when I've had a rough day and I feel like I've faced rejection from myself, from others, man, that shower, I'm trying to wash off a lot more than just the dirt that's on my body. I'm trying to wash off the emotions of the feelings that come with being rejected. As I lay my head on pillow at night and I'm trying to have some peace of mind, some rest, my mind is just repeating what happened that day and the feelings of rejection become so real. In that moment, what we have got to do is we can't focus on what people put on us. We can't think about our status with ourselves or with others. We have to remind ourselves of the scriptures, of the truth, of God, of God's kingdom. We gotta get off that operating system of confusion, that operating system that where I'm the standard. No, we need to go to a different operating system the kingdom of God that's found in the truth of scriptures and find out that God's status doesn't change. My my life, his status of me doesn't change because of my shortcomings. No, in Christ, his promises are yes and amen. In Christ, I'm seated in heavenly places. In Christ, I'm loved. In Christ, I'm accepted. In Christ, I'm chosen. That right there at the end of the night, knowing that, Man, it brings such a a peace to my heart and a confidence. It doesn't make all my problems go away. 
But there is something at the end of the day that I can, that I can rest with. When that happens, I find myself, it is easier to pray. It's easier to, to worship. It's easier to think about God because I remind myself that I am not rejected, but I am I'm chosen. When I look at the disciples, I see this battle that's going on with us in this moment. It's not like everything just happened. Jesus gave them a command. And he says, remain in Jerusalem. Remain and wait for the promise. I always think about what might have happened in that moment, how all the things that were going on. I mean, people are trying to find the body of Jesus, the Jews, the Romans, and there's chaos going on everywhere and how easy it would have been to join in the chaos and run away and try to go and hide and find their own way of working things out. But the scripture tells us in Acts 1.12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivier, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journey away. You and I have a battle every day. You and I, we can look at how we feel. We can look at what people say about us. We can look at our shortcomings and try to determine how God thinks about us. Or we can go to the truth of the scriptures and we can find God's truth And what we can do is we can walk in that truth just like the disciples did. They they stayed in Jerusalem. They went to where God and Jesus had commanded them to go. And at the end of the night, beginning of the day, man, we must remind ourselves of who we are because of Jesus. Who we are because of what Jesus did. What God thinks about us and he shows us what he thinks about us through Jesus. That even when we were dead in sin, even when we deserved wrath, even when we deserved to be rejected, even when our status deserved to be changed from selected and chosen to rejected, and his, I can't do my promises for them. Look at how, no, he doesn't do that. He looks at us in Christ, in Jesus. And my friends, right where you're seated, whatever you're going through in life, guess what? In Christ, you are chosen. Other people might have rejected you. You might be rejecting yourself. You might look at your bank account. You might look at your savings account. You might look at the job that you're working and think, man, if if God chose me, then wouldn't I be having some type of different life that I'm living right now? But the truth is none of those things determine if you're chosen. What determines if you're chosen is Jesus. And he shows us here in Acts 1 with his apostles that their shortcomings and their life did not change their status with Jesus. That the promise of the Father was still faithful, was still yes, was still good. And you, wherever you're seating, wherever you're watching this, whether you're in a break room, you're in your living room, you're in your bedroom, in whatever state your mind is in, I'm praying by the power of the Holy Spirit this truth will hit your heart that you are chosen by God, that you deserved wrath, but God loves you. God gives you mercy. God gives you grace. He seats you with Christ. He places you with Christ and he sees you in Christ. And at the end of the day, you can know, regardless of what happens in your life, you are chosen. You're chosen by God and nothing can change that. And so right now, I'm praying that all of a sudden you'll see that I have a confidence to approach God. I no longer have to look at God through my standards, through the standards of this world, the governments of this world, the kingdom of this world. God's kingdom is a different kingdom. It operates on a different system. And I need to look at that. That system is found in the truth of the Jesus, found in the truth of scriptures. And when I see that, I see that I am chosen. And because I'm chosen, I can run to God, not fearful because I don't have it all together. No, I can go to God. Why? Because my status doesn't change because of my shortcomings. I can go to God and I can thank him and receive from him his peace and his joy, his help, his provision, his strength, his encouragement. Why? Because my status with him is in Jesus. I am chosen and his promises for me our yes and amen. Let me pray for you. Father, right now, I thank you for every person that's listening to this. And regardless of the feelings that are trying to arise, regardless of what others have said over them, maybe a parental figure, maybe a coach, maybe a teacher, maybe a friend, 
maybe social media. God, I thank you that your word is stronger, that your word is truer, and that your truth of your word right now would just touch hearts and touch minds and let them know that you choose them. You choose them and that you're going to bless them, that your promises for them are yes and amen, not because of their good works and not because of their bad works. It's because of Jesus, because of your great love for them. And so, Father, today, I just thank you that right now that we can rest and we can know that we are chosen, that your confidence can fill our heart because we know that we can run with you, we can walk with you, we can work with you because you don't change our status based on our shortcomings. We just bless every heart, every family, every child right now, God, that your truth would rise in their heart to let them know they are chosen. Amen. Hey, we love you so much. We're looking forward to gathering together soon, worshiping together, seeing one another's faces, and being encouraged in our faith together. But until then, be encouraged and know you are chosen. Thanks again for joining us online. 
We hope you enjoyed this message and time of worship. We would like to thank you for your generosity and faithfulness during this season. It is because of you that we are able to help others experience the love of God. You may continue to give online through our app or by mail. We really miss coming together as a community. Although we aren't able to gather together on a Sunday, we still want to give you an opportunity to connect with us and others. We are preparing to launch growth groups, which includes Bible studies, watch parties, and interest-based groups that meet both virtually and in person. To start, please complete our interest survey to let us know what types of groups you would like to participate in or even lead. The link can be found in our social media bios as well as the description of this video. Also, please know that you can reach out to us at any time by emailing us at info at fhtulsa.com. Follow us on social media and please, please, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Remember to turn on your notifications so that you can receive updates on any new posts, both on YouTube and on our app. We, we love, love you. you. See, See you online next week. week.